But I started this art uh, practice, of course, as a little kid. I wish I was born an artist. Because when I was about two years old, my mom found me in the kitchen tracing cartoons out of a newspaper. And from that point on, my family always called me the little artist. So that support and motivation, I'm sure, uh, contributed to my ego today. <laughs> and um, I, I moved through an art high school, I had a music major in high school and art major in college. Uh, but my major was actually graphic design because my family felt that to make a living, you had to have something like that. You couldn't just be an artist. So I did make a living as a graphic designer until about maybe 1980 or 81. Not a good living. You know, I, I call myself the master of low budget graphic design. <laughs> <laughs> All my clients were nonprofits in New Jersey. I did brochures and things for New Jersey Opera, New Jersey Ballet, and places like that. Uh, but then I was lucky enough to get a job doing computer graphics back when the computer industry was very new. In fact, our workstation uh, looked like the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> and that's the job that kind of changed my life because they fired me. <laughs> the firing gave me a scholarship, which was called unemployment. <laughs> so I was able to spend the next year just working on my, my art. And uh, that's when my life changed. Uh, and I went to school in the 70s where we were focused on photorealism. But now I see Basquiat having big success drawing more like a child than like a person who has a degree in fine art with a major in photorealism. And I, I said, my style is not going to get me anywhere. So a good friend of mine who was a dealer of African art suggested I switch to sculpture. And that's what I did. So my influences were first African art, but also toys. <laughs> my, my son uh, had a toy called the Transformer, which is what this is. <laughs> and he blew my mind by coming in one minute with a gun, and next minute it's a car, and it's a tiger, and all those things. So I said, you know, that's what I'm going to try to do with everyday objects. I'm going to do transformations. So the first object that really caught my eye was the iron, but not so much by choice. I like to say that the objects choose me rather than me choosing them. And the way this choice occurred, I had a residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem, and I lived in Newark, New Jersey. So every day I'm walking down Railroad Avenue going to Penn Station to catch the train to New York. And during that journey, I, f I saw an iron on the street that had been run over by a car. And it was, uh, it was totally flat, but it looked very much like an African mask. So I photographed it with a Polaroid, which we had back in those days. Over time, it just became uh, my main tool. This also was the time where branding was a big deal in the world. So I decided I would make the Scorch my brand. And I spent uh, probably the next 15 years making art out of steam irons. Uh, initially, I would take them apart and reassemble them, like a single iron dismantled and reassembled thinking that I was more like a, an urban uh, archaeologist. I actually called myself an archaeological at the rapid dadaist at that time. <laughs> so I would, I would assemble these things to make them look like other things. But eventually I started using the iron for its heat properties. <laughs> I felt that if I wanted to show the spirit of the iron, the evidence of the spirit was in the heat. You know, not so much in the shell. I think, like, I'm looking at you, you people, I'm looking at all of us here, human beings, I'm seeing our shells and I'm seeing our spirits. So I felt the same way about the iron. I was seeing the shell of the iron by seeing the body and the handle, but the spirit of the iron, the life force of the iron, was the heat. So I started doing the scorches, uh, some on wood, some on paper, and some on canvas. I made a list of everything the iron suggested me. So the iron has a black handle. And my personal preference was my great grandmother who worked as a domestic for a doctor my whole life. So the black handle led to the housekeeper or the manny or the whatever you want to call it who worked for the for the wealthier young. So, you know, what where, what did that come from? That came from a deeper form of servitude, slavery, which came from the kind of accident. Because the handle was black, all this made sense to me in that direction. Uh, the iron sole plate part was hot, it's kind of shaped like a boat. So that gave me that as an option too. Well, these two things together are pissed out here because in Africa and the boat kind of led to the slave ship, which, which we can know from me as well. 
Uh, the iron also was about domesticity, and not just domestic service, but just domesticity. Can you forget how to make that? That became a house plan. Because after the housing projects, we didn't have houses, we had apartments. But here, it evolves to a house. And because I didn't have that, that meant money to me. Which this also meant money to some people. So this chart kind of shows the, the physical, the material, the chemical, the spatiality of the iron. So up top, what I call the higher level, the element of iron, is Fe, I think it's uh, maybe 21 protons and 15 neutrons. But the iron, that's in mixing without water, so you have water there. And of course, heat. But the next level up, the spiritual level, keep it in mind all of its other things, especially in Africa. Those are the uh, gods that the elements symbolize. So the West African tradition of uh, the Yoruba people called Tifa, the god of iron is Ogun. Uh, the god of fire is Shango. And the goddess of the, of the sea of the ocean. My first public uh, display of work made from steam mines. This is at Brook Alexander Gallery in New York, I think around 1990. And I called these domestic shields. <laughs> and I was kind of inspired by the Zulu shield because I had been very involved in the Heart Against Apartheid movement in New York and the Zulu or you know, South African area. But so the shields had names like the brands. There was the Sunbeam, the Silex, the GE. Those are various tribes. So this is the first time I employed the concept of tribes and scorches combined. So of course this is uh, an image of a slave ship. And you can see how the cargo is laid out all around there. I had this image in a book from childhood. And I was moving out of my studio in 19... 94, packing up, I found this book. And the book image inspired me to make the piece that's here called Stowage. So you can see, I guess you have a book on the same, but you can see the connection between the two shapes and the patterns and all that. But when I made this piece, I felt like it was my thesis piece because all of New York got excited about it. And it really catapulted my career to a different level, or to a greater level, I should say. But more currently, I, I'm doing a lot of out of water bottles. And I got an opportunity to show at a place in New Jersey called Grounds for Sculpture, which is a big, beautiful outdoor sculpture park. And I was very excited about this opportunity, but when I had my first meeting, I found out that there was no budget for production. And that they didn't want me to exhibit outdoors, they wanted to put me in one of their indoor galleries. So I have a friend who's like a great advisor I've known him for probably 20 years, so we're sitting by his pond talking about the show, drinking water, and fish are swimming around in the, in the pond, bobbing for food, and I'm squeezing my water bottle, because you know, the water bottle is like an accordion, it's got all these folds and designs in it, so it can be collapsed and crushed easily. So through that process, I decided and realized I could make anything out of a water bottle. So I came with a plan to collect water bottles, for example, my mom lives in the two, the two twin buildings, 22 stories. And I asked her, Mom, can you speak to the janitor? So now the janitor, every, every week, they give me about 400 water bottles. <laughs> I went to my local YMCA. Same thing, everybody's in the Y, the treadmill's drinking water. They give me water bottles. Currently, I have a commission from the city of Summit, New Jersey, so Summit, the mayor has approved. They have bins all around the city with my picture on them. <laughs> and my project listed. So the whole city's coming to water bottles for me. <laughs> so I feel good that I have uh, brought recycling to so many people who would not normally do it. <laughs> but even before this occurred, I received a recycling award from uh, Mars County, New Jersey. Summit, New Jersey. Uh, so this is 2,000 water bottles, but they're strong individuals, so the inside is hollow. So the video previously was the inside of this. Well, again, it's all about, about the energy. So I recognize that water is a basic element of life. Uh, we take the water from the bottle, we pour it in our mouth, so now air goes in the bottle, another great and important element in life. Uh, 
So that became like a spirit thing for me. Uh, the oneness of it all through multiplication of a single object has a link to Buddhism. So that's how Buddha got in the Bible. But the piece actually came to me in a dream, and Buddha was in the Bible in a dream, so I just followed, followed through with that. The current addiction is also shoes. <laughs> And my first shoe piece was inspired by Melvin Marcos. Of course. Um, and it was a chair called Made in the Philippines because she was the Philippine disco shoe queen. The first masks that I did were only the uh, front view, made to hang on the wall. <coughs> but now I've made them in the rounds, they have a front and back. Uh, the front is driving and the back is kind of following. But once the back occurs, it seems to have a story of its own. So I get excited about these. Now this was called Soul Brother Number One. Because I'm a big fan of the original Soul Brother, James Brown. And uh, the first shoe mask, they were named after women because it was the women's shoes. This is the first one became a male. And I'm not sure why that happened, but maybe because James Brown passed away, I'm not sure. Your irons are such charged pieces, and you were being coy with the shoes, talking about you like the form, but what else does the shoe, its iconography, its symbolic meaning, sort of, what do you hope that also conveys as well, other than just the form of it? Right. Well, to me, the shoe is like, you think about, as a male, think about America, think about guns, Corvettes, and guitars. The shoe fits in that same category. So the shoe is what I would call an anxious object. It's already loaded with history and mythology and desire. I mean, it's a work of art within itself. So I want you to sense all of that. But I also want you to question who the shoe belonged to. I had a student at the University of Georgia as a fellow at UGA for one year, I think in 2005, where I started doing these masks and things. And one of my students, a female, would come in and she would just do the history of the shoes, walk through the studio. Prom shoes, wedding shoes, dance shoes, hooker shoes. So I want you to feel and sense that as well. I used to tell myself that I was sensing the uh, use and origin of the shoe to get inspired for the piece. But I've kind of, I don't feel that way anymore. Now I'm just responding to the shape of the shoe. I'm looking at the shoe, one shoe, looking at the transformation of the shoe by itself. <coughs> My, my aesthetic has traveled a lot. Like I said, it went from Tibet to cartoons to Africa. You know, so it's all mixed up. But, but my goal is to be open to all, all the energy.